Like generative AI is a conversation with data. So right now you may be asking that data set to generate an image or a, a piece or logo or something fun for your website. But what if that data was instead data pertaining to biology or medical formulas? And instead of asking the system for a picture of a horse on the moon, you're asking for a formula to solve or combat this very specific rare illness or DNA strand that seems to have a mutation that just 5% of the population have. And those are the types of problems that AI is gonna also help solve at scale. Sinead Bavel, <laughs> welcome to the Gen's Talk podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, we want to talk about AI mm. in the future. Okay. Are we doomed? <laughs> right out the gate, are right we doomed? Right out the gate, are we doomed? Should I be worried? Should I call my mom? Um, give me an example of what you think we should be worried about. Well, I, um, despite my question, am excited about where AI is going, where the future holds, or what the future holds. But I also have seen what humanity can do. And I'm concerned that AI in the wrong hands could not end well for us. And I also have a lot of creative friends in the in the industry who talk about, you know, concern over their, their work, their jobs. And we saw just recently with the, the strikes for the actors and the writers where they're concerned about AI utilizing their likeness and perpetuity and eventually they would be out of a job. So I think the question stems from whether AI is inherently good or bad and we should be worried, or is it just potentially bad because it could be in the wrong hands? Or am I even framing it all the wrong way? No, uh, I think you're framing it correctly and all of those worries are very, very real and, and I share them too. I don't think the technology is inherently good or bad. I don't think it's neutral. I don't think any technology is neutral. It's a product of the environment it's been built by, or built in, who's building it, the global cultural landscape. When it comes to artificial intelligence in particular, there are a lot more unknowns. It essentially takes any problem that we currently have and accentuates it. Um, and then it throws in more emergent problems that we haven't seen before. So it's not just a technology that's going to transform how we live. It can also make decisions and invent things. So the magnitude of what we're trying to control and understand is a lot greater. I don't think we are inherently doomed at all. I think the way AI can help us transform how we live for the better is really exciting. But it does come down to the decisions, the human decisions we make around it and the people who are empowered to make those decisions. And that's where there are quite a few question marks. Are you concerned? What do you think when you when you, you obviously so you, you go around talking um, generally through the U.N., right? Uh, yeah. Is it OK? Can we cut this? I can't really speak on behalf of them. Okay. So you can yeah. say that I speak there. I've spoken speak at the UN. At the UN. Yeah, but okay. I just have to be careful of how I phrase that, if sure. that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So you speak at the UN regularly. What, What's the general consensus there? What are people thinking? What are they talking about? What are they concerned about? What are they excited about? Yeah, I think like any kind of global convening body... There's concerns about things like access. So right now, conversations around AI and even AI risk, they're largely focused around the West. And there's an entire rest of the globe that is kind of getting left behind, uh, include digitally. So there's 2.6 billion people that aren't even on or haven't even used the internet. Uh, and now we're talking about AI systems and getting kind of economically left behind. So they're concerned about that. But there's also a lot of concern AI, like a pandemic, is a group project. All hands have to be on deck. So one country can decide to kind of govern or build the system or safety features one way. But if the rest of the globe isn't really on board, it's kind of a lost cause. Hmm. So I think 
governing global governing bodies like the UN are trying to convene as many stakeholders as possible from as many diverse backgrounds and groups and countries as possible to ensure we're all steering the ship in the right direction. And there's a lot of geopolitically challenging things going on at this moment. So it is adding AI to this fire makes it a little bit more challenging. But I think it's how can we align as many countries and decision makers and leaders as possible with this technology, because we all do need to get it right. It's in all of our best interest to make sure we get our future with this technology right. What happens if we get it wrong? Yeah, if we, it depends how wrong. Uh, I mean, we're not necessarily getting it entirely right right now, right? We don't know if you've been issued a loan or if you've been accepted or denied to university, there's a good chance an AI is part of that decision or if you did or didn't see a job posting. And so that could already be a way that you're being kind of left behind or left out um, and not granted access. So there's already kind of small ways AI is in our world causing harm. It's doing a lot of good. It's already helping with things like drug discovery, but there are already kind of small micro ways that it's challenging how we live that people don't even realize. And that's also some of the challenges with the conversations around AI risk. On the one hand, we see these conversations dominated in the news cycles about AI takeover and losing control of the technology and super intelligence. And sure, maybe there should be a small group of scientists working to kind of better understand different ways the technology might uh, develop or evolve that we don't necessarily understand. For by and large, most of us should be really tuning in to the potential harms that exist right now. Who's not getting accepted to college? Who isn't seeing a job posting? Who's getting screwed out of a, a mortgage rate or, or a loan? Those problems are here right now, and they're very, very real. And AI can, you, um, so the business, for my limited knowledge of AI, it's what, I guess it's gathered from the internet, put into the system but it's only based on who puts it in, right? Yeah, so uh, AI is largely two things. It's um, the data that it's been trained on, and most of the big AI systems that we're using today were trained on data from the internet. So all of the amazing things on the internet, and then all of the rest of the internet, uh, along <laughs> with the, the decisions or the programs or algorithms uh, of the programmers who made the system. So that's essentially what artificial intelligence is. It's the data and then the series of algorithms uh, or programming decisions that a program ha programmer has made. Couldn't the programmer, because programmers are still human, if they put, I guess, let's call it evil because you keep talking about doomed. <laughs> if they program it incorrectly and this becomes the new wave, wouldn't it just mean that everything would be, I guess, doomed in that sense? And do you mean if a programmer made a mistake or... Or let's say they... Malicious intent. Yes, mm -hmm. malicious intent. Yeah, so it... So, sure, I'm sure with any technology, you could build in ways that it's going to do things that are going to cause harm. Uh, with AI, the algorithms actually kind of learn to spot the patterns on their own in the data that they're trained on. Um, sure, a programmer could maliciously say, you know, pay attention to this variable and that's going to cause certain harm uh, in this way or that way, uh, or, you know, uncover some kind of harmful bioweapon uh, using these technologies. Sure, that's all possible. Um, but those are also part of the real harms that a lot of companies, governments are looking into to try to safeguard. But it also comes down to there's a really big debate right now in the AI world. Should these systems be open source or closed source? And in case anybody isn't familiar, an open source AI system or an open source technology, you can kind of think of it like a, a recipe or a cookbook where we all have access to the recipes. Uh, and this is what we've done with technology, most of technology in history. So the web is largely open source. The cryptographic algorithms that keep the internet safe, why we can all send you know, emails and, and do online banking, those are open source algorithms that a bunch of mathematicians work on together uh, and keep improving. So should we have AI systems where we can all see the code, we can all see what they were trained on, and we can all try to make them better? But that also means some of the more powerful tech parts of artificial intelligence would be in the hands of maybe not the best actors. Or should we have more closed source AI systems? So maybe we have a 
few really powerful companies with the most powerful AI systems, and they get to decide who gets access to them. On the one hand, they can put in safeguards so you can make sure somebody who you probably don't want to be running around with AI isn't, uh, but does that close off potential creativity and openness? Uh, and what if then there's only a few companies that are kind of leading this future? And that's not how tech has historically been. And granted, AI, it's a very different technology. I think there's historians like Yuval Noah Harari who say it's very different than the printing press or nuclear arms because it can make a decision by itself. If the printing press wasn't going and making more printing presses on its own, humans have to do that. Right. AI, it's a little bit different. But are we also maybe overreacting? Maybe we're some of the gloom and doom and some of the anthropomorphized tendencies we have are kind of taking over. And so this is kind of a big debate right now in, in the AI world. Should it be open source or should it not? What do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, by, I, think op I think open. I agree. I think it should be open source. I wouldn't trust a, a, a few big companies to, to there's control there's allegedly that. a lot of corruption in, in big companies. So if you, just, if you have a monopoly over it, who's and no one else is there to, I guess, debate you Keep on it. Them in yeah, check not be malicious. Like, let's say you just believe this. You can still be wrong in that belief. So you program it and you put all these things to believe in this belief that is might not be correct and if you are the only body that is in charge of it then that is the way it goes no sure yeah i think i mean definitely less it wouldn't be as innovative as a future potentially um if ai the the frontier ai models the best and the most powerful ai models are only allowed to be in the hands of a few companies it would probably hamper innovation in some ways now the argument is but if that's going to be a lot better for safety then maybe that's a trade-off we're willing to pay but some believe that's not necessarily even true. The more mm -hmm. transparent a system is, well, the more we can all contribute and see if, if this is kind of going to go astray or not, or what data was fed into it. And was that data kind of equitable? Is everybody present in that data and represented or not? So the jury is still out in terms of where do I stand with open source? It's actually something that I go back and forth on a lot. So where I would stand today, maybe we don't yet know enough about these systems and not because I think that they have some demonic or some potential way to kind of take over, but maybe we just don't understand enough yet about these systems and their potential use that it should be open source right now. So maybe we take a second before the biggest and best models are open source and anyone can run free with them, but we should highly, highly consider making them open source or at least not banning that as an option in the future uh, once we get a bit more information. So maybe it looks like the next six months we have scientists, researchers, academics, and private companies answering these questions, working together to figure it out. But I don't think we should close the book and say only a few companies should have the right to build the best AI systems because I'm not necessarily convinced that that's the best option. Uh, but again, I'll be back in a week and I might say something different. I go back and forth, but my hunch is we, st we shouldn't have a verdict yet. We should really be doing the groundwork to make sure we answer that question right because it's a pretty big one. I mean, you could imagine, imagine if they decided not to make the web open or with the US military figuring out GPS and imagine they decided, no, this should actually just be in the hand. This is a, and GPS is quite a powerful technology when you think of how it can it is used for militaries, and that could have very well been a decision that you know maybe this should just stay with us. And all of the different apps from social media to Uber are all built off of the decision to make yeah. that open source. So I think it's a big question, uh, and it's one I don't think any one person can answer. I certainly can't even answer it w with myself. <laughs> it's a big one, but yeah. it's an important one. Is that happening right now? Are you seeing a collaborative approach between the private companies, between the scientists, the data scientists, and the professors and the academics? Do you see a collaborative approach happening, or are you seeing resistance? There actually is. So I think one thing that's good about this moment is we've all kind of woken up to the reality that we don't want just a few people making decisions on our behalf. Social media, we tried that. Not sure if the group project, aka group, you know, group chat is going as well as we thought it would. And so a lot of different voices are really coming to the table and being called to the table. Some would maybe argue that some of the proposals for regulating AI seem to favor some of the suggestions from bigger companies. 
Um, again, you know, only certain companies being able to build the biggest and the best. Well, of course, that would economically advantage um, certain companies as well. So that yeah. is definitely a critique uh, and one that a lot of people are watching. But there are a lot of professors and researchers that are kind of sounding the alarm, you know, putting out their proposals. And that I'm quite optimistic about. Both here in Canada, in the UK, in the US, um, there's all been there's been a lot of summits and a lot of different movements around it. And so that I think feels good. There's a lot more voices weighing in, or at least trying to weigh in. Which I think is super important, mm -hmm. especially for a technology that can have the kind of impact that AI can have on us. Yeah, because it's going to be a general purpose technology. So like the electricity or the internet, uh, it's going to be something that everything gets built on top of. So similar to how we stream the internet, we'll start streaming artificial intelligence. Uh, so that's a, quite a profound change. And it isn't just a technology that we use. It's a technology that also invents. So it will be a tool that will allow us to invent new chapters of science or new industries that we just fundamentally can't even process yet. And right now, AI is not capable of thinking for itself, or are we already there? Do you mean... Th I think sentient is the word. Okay. Oh, yes. I, I mean, I would come down and say absolutely no. I think most scientists would agree. There's, of course, sentience and consciousness, so slightly different. I think we can't, maybe people would say you can't rule out that it, these systems aren't conscious. I would be entirely comfortable saying they are not conscious at all. No. Um, and I have no worries about this the systems we have today, the systems we'll have next year, uh, being conscious or sentient at all. Like you see, you see us still being a ways away from getting to that level. Yeah, I think... I mean, we don't even know what consciousness fully, we know what it is. We don't know how to relate it to matter. So trying to program it um, is an entirely different problem that we don't even necessarily have the tools to figure out how to solve. There are some voices who believe if we continue to just power these systems with more compute, more data, they might inherently just get a bigger and better understanding of the world um, and then may have... Um, assertions or viewpoints that would seem to maybe align with being conscious, but I don't really subscribe to the belief that um, a system entirely just based on ones and zeros is going to be conscious. It doesn't rule out um, the way we're starting to edit DNA in more biological settings and maybe mm -hmm. merging that with a, an AI system, but I, I'm not really worried that GPT-6 is suddenly actually going to be alive and have to get enrolled in school and go ever. get a passport. <laughs> ever? Ever. Oh, I wouldn't say ever. But just in the... Because I think we... I wouldn't say ever. I think the systems we have today and how we're currently building AI, we're going to build some pretty powerful systems, but I wouldn't necess necessarily say they will eventually inherently be conscious. I think we're mm. going to have to build AI a little bit differently if we want it to possess different kind of more biological uh, capacities. But I'm also not a biologist. Mm. I'm not um, a neuroscientist. And there are neuroscientists that believe that maybe these systems but could one day. But again, yeah, I don't necessarily subscribe to, the, to these types of systems being conscious. Not that we won't ever be able to figure out how to do that digitally. But mm. I don't think it's any things soon or anything that we should actively all be worried about everybody meet on monday what are what's the plan <laughs> i don't think that that's where we are okay so ai right now is fed data and that's essentially its brain right for lack of a better term um but data pulled from the internet as you've kind of alluded to a little earlier is a mashup of nonsense and facts how is how can we as consumers, as users, how could we rely on an AI that's pulling data from the internet and giving it to us as fact? Um, how could we be confident of the information we're receiving, given that it could simply go to a Wikipedia page or another page that somebody wrote something on and edited and then said, you know, um, you know, th this jacket is red, for example, something like that. On the receiving end of that, how do we know the information we're receiving is actually accurate? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and 
I think there's kind of three stages to this answer. So first, I think companies that are building AI systems do have a fundamental responsibility to make sure these systems are safe uh, and they work as intended. We don't usually accept software that makes a lot of mistakes, but for some reason when it comes to AI, we're kind of tolerating what we call a bunch of hallucinations or AI that kind of just makes stuff up or, or pulls nonsense from, from the internet or harmful things like bias or, or racist and kind of sexist views. Mm -hmm. So I think at a company level, before these models are released, there needs to be a fundamental um, change and maybe that's through legislation or maybe that's through standards. Uh, but before a model is, is released, it meets certain uh, standards or it meets certain safety measures and it isn't just spewing nonsense uh, or things that are harmful. Um, and maybe the middle path there is some sort of legislation or some sort of auditing of these systems before they go live to air. But then I also think as consumers, we should start do our best, and this is going to require education and changing our actual, the faculty of education, to have more AI literacy. Uh, so to understand when we do interact with these, these systems, what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. Right now, they're not capable of the systems that we have today, especially the generative AI systems, they're not capable of 100% accuracy. So it's important that we know that so we're not taking what an AI says verbatim and going on and acting on that. Uh, and there are some companies that will put in certain safeguards in their system so you can't maybe get specific medical advice. Uh, so I guess one, so they're not liable, but two, so people aren't kind of going off into their kitchen yeah. and cooking up you know, a homemade antibiotic <laughs> uh, that's just been scraped from the depths of Reddit or something. Yeah. Uh, but I think companies need to do a lot better. We need to have some form of an intermediary, maybe that's regulation or at least auditing requirements of companies the way we do with accounting firms uh, so they aren't as unpredictable as they are today. Yeah. And then we need some AI literacy on the consumer end. And this actually doesn't just apply to AI companies. If your company is using AI to, for hiring decisions, or if you are one of the many companies that has thrown the word AI on its website, we are now an AI first XYZ. Well, you now are an AI company and you have a responsibility to think of the ethical implications of this technology. And I don't think we're thinking that way yet. So I think we do need a bit of a mindset shift on what it means to interact with these systems and to use them as fairly and safely as possible. How do we apply a moral framework around AI when as humans we can't agree on a moral framework for our own interactions with one another? Yeah, it's a big debated question. Um, and who gets to decide, right? Who's, yeah. Whose version of, of morals or ethics? There are certain companies, for example, one is Anthropic, and they're in, in those kind of high-level rooms of the biggest and best AI systems being built. They're one of the companies that are often invited to those rooms. And they're building what they call an, a constitutional AI system. So they're trying to train it on what it, they believe is humanity's morals um, and kind of ethical frameworks. And they think that they've found a kind of path to do that. But of course, there's a lot of skepticism because again, who's, who's version of ethics are you using? Right. Um, and what do they believe in? And what era was that from? Uh, and I think that's actually the fundamental challenge of, of humanity. Who gets to decide right and wrong? I think what's most important is making sure AI doesn't violate any fundamental human rights. Um, that's a bit more concrete. But when it comes to morals and ethics, um, there's a lot of different frameworks that some that people would use to make a decision that they deemed as ethical or not. Hmm. So it's a very blurry. How do you deal with the you're talking with the bias of it? Because those are just that's more just opinion, right? Uh, like if if it is if an AI system makes a biased decision. Yeah. Yeah. So bias it usually comes from so AI is. As I had stated, AI is a reflection of the data it's trained on and some of the opinions of the programmers who made the system. Data comes from society and usually comes from the past. The past is often something we're trying not to repeat. So, for example, um, there were certain chapters in history where certain groups were economically discriminated against and couldn't get access to a loan. And so if you were to build an AI system taking financial data for the, from the last 30 years, there might be a group who's been discriminated against in that data set. And the AI kind of perpetuates that if it's just deployed into the wild and no one kind of does anything to check for bias. 
But the good thing is, we know bias exists. We have historians and philosophers and sociologists and anthropologists. We have all sorts of ways to uncover what segments of society were maybe left behind or not included or discriminated against. So while every system is biased, and it's important that we recognize that so we can go in critically and try to tame that bias, we can do things to minimize it or to make data more representative of the population and of society more broadly. We just have to think about that in the first place. And that's why diversity, when people say diversity in STEM, and I know some people kind of roll their eyes, it actually is really important that there's diversity in these coding rooms. So you have more voices who know to spot these types of biases and historical power imbalances to begin with, because it's not necessarily even malicious. I don't think there's many programmers that are trying to discriminate against certain groups. You just may have not even realized certain mm. segments of society were left out in this decade mm. or in this decision or in this chapter. But the more diverse voices you have around the table, the least likely or the better off you are or the more likely you are for someone to be able to spot a group that may have been left out or kind of discriminated against in some way. What are the pros of AI? Like, how, What's the, the best case scenario? How does this enhance our future? I mean, AI has already been a game changer for us. I can't get down the road without consulting Google Maps, um, Uber, any of the kind of ride hailing or food delivery, um, fraud detection on your credit card. I'm so thrilled every time I get that text that says your credit card has been locked, somebody attempted to use it, and I'm not trying to sort out Microsoft Excel sheets and, and figure that out myself. Right. What can we do in the future? So if most of the biggest transformations in human history are a result of human intelligence uh, and the more knowledge we've been able to have and kind of the smarter and more empowered society, the more we've been able to evolve. And so now we're kind of turbocharging that, uh, kind of disseminating intelligence or artificial intelligence at scale. Um, and that, if we look historically, can be a really good thing. So one thing is, for example, AI is largely generative AI is a conversation with data. So right now, you may be asking that data set to generate an image or a, a piece or a logo or something fun for your website. But what if that data was instead data pertaining to biology or medical formulas? And instead of asking the system for a picture of a horse on the moon, you're asking for a formula to solve or combat this very specific rare illness or DNA strand that seems to have a mutation that just 5% of the population have. And those are the types of problems that AI is going to also help solve at scale. And also just humans, we're not necessarily designed to be able to encompass and understand large amounts of data all at once. We just can't fundamentally to track that sort of thing. But maybe you're somebody that gets migraines, and it seems like you get migraines randomly. What a future with AI would mean is maybe you start just taking photos of your meal. That's all you do. You send it to your AI. You take a photo of what's in your fridge, and maybe you sync your AI with a Fitbit. In a couple of weeks, the AI lets you know 24 hours after you have garlic, that's when your, when your migraines start. So it's being empowered with AI at that type of scale. Uh, and that's a massive unlock. And then again, I mean, physics, chemistry, biology, these were all inventions of, of humans. AI is going to help us peel back science uh, and invent new layers of science and really put that type of invention and that type of superpower into the hands of a lot more people. And then even things like education. We, our education is based off of the Industrial Revolution. It's like one person to a classroom of 30. Uh, mm -hmm. The teachers are always kind of, it's always so much on them. They're already kind of overworked. And we know that kids learn differently. Everybody has a different learning style. So with AI, you actually do get a chance at kind of customized uh, lesson plans, which could be helpful. The teacher makes one lesson plan and AI customizes it with video and imagery and different text for each student. So all of those are just kind of even scratching the surface. And when it comes to the cool, exciting things, like actually trying to understand consciousness, we now have something have a system that thinks in a very different way than humans do. And that's a good thing, pointing it at problems that we haven't been able to solve. Like who else is out in the universe, if anyone? Or how did humans and life even form and why? These are the types of big questions that may require massive amounts of data that we're not equipped to solve, but maybe AI is. Mm. 
It's mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, my the wheels are spinning in my head. <laughs> what is if I'm let's say I'm talking to my grandmother and I'm like, oh, we talked to Sinead about AI and she's what is AI? I was like, oh, start here. Like, what would be the place to start to learn about AI and Chat GPT? To learn about what it is or to kind of play around with it? Both. Yeah, so I would say uh, an AI is a system that helps makes pre- an AI is a system that makes predictions based on data that it's been trained on. Uh, whether it's predicting what word should come next in a sentence, like what ChatGPT does, uh, or it's predicting what illness it thinks you have because it's been studied on, or it's been used, to, or it's been studied on some of your medical data. In terms of somebody wanting to play around with a, an AI system, I would recommend engaging with a system like ChatGPT. And here's why this latest kind of innovation in technology is really exciting. Digital literacy, like digital skills, using a computer, using a smartphone, it's not necessarily intuitive for people. But what's happened in these latest breakthroughs with AI and why they've gone so viral is because the computing interface is just natural language. And that's why a system like ChatGPT scales to a million users in five days. You talk to it the way you talk to a friend in a group chat. And that's going to be a lot better and more inclusive for many different segments of society who digital literacy and kind of pounding around on a computer isn't doesn't come naturally for. So for somebody that is kind of new to the space, playing around with even a free version of ChatGPT, and if you're able to just go to the website, you can talk to that system. You don't even have to type uh, and ask it, you know, what color is the sky or ask it for a poem and just start to have fun to see how this system creates. And once I, once you do that one or two times, you ask it one or two questions, you realize the potential uh, and then it just kind of speaks for itself. What would you get from, I guess, the unfree version? What is the difference? Uh, so if if you're going to if you're a company for example you would want to pay for like an enterprise version of ChatGPT to make sure it's not storing your company's data so if your employees are using the system and they're asking it to help with a marketing campaign you don't want that data now being fed into ChatGPT and other people being able to access it so an enterprise version would mean it would erase any inquiries um, that people in your company have made and then a paid version of ChatGPT, just a smaller kind of paid version, um, allows you to do things like access the multimodal version. So multimodal AI means it can process many different types of inputs. You can send it an image, you can send it audio, or you can send it text. And it can generate images, or it can respond in audio, or respond in text, and soon to be video. Um, and so that's a feature that they have kind of locked mm-hmm. behind a paywall. Um, But if you want to just ask it a few questions or you want to use it as a creative partner, there's nothing kind of proprietary at stake. The free version is perfectly fine. Um, And just to have fun with and just see how it responds to certain questions that you have. I wouldn't put your medical data there. Mm. Um, (laughs) But if you just want to, you know, write poetry or just test this thing out, I would highly recommend that. It's a lot of fun. I've asked a a few questions. I just, because people always say, how to use it, just talk to it. So I'll ask a question here and there. I'm like, okay, I get it. I remember I asked the one question. I can't remember the question off the top of my head. But it was a very long answer. So I tried. I was like, make it simpler, please. You could, And it made it simpler. I was like, mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> and that's just the power of the... I use it every day. So, for example, if you have a podcast guest coming in, you could ask it. We're interviewing this guest. What are 10 questions, 10 really interesting questions that probably this person probably hasn't received before? and see what it says. And it would search the web and come back with whatever it's found and could suggest questions for you. Or if you're writing an email and you're like, this needs to sound better or more creative, ask the system to, to rewrite it. Or if you do any form of writing or captions or op-eds, ask the system to edit. And it's really, really interesting. But I think co-creating with it is something that I find fascinating. Even like panel questions and things and seeing how it thinks, because it just point it, it these systems obviously think very different than us and that makes them very interesting what point do we need to get to before i can get an ai assistant to basically plan out my week for me hey like i'm on the go hey make me reservations at x restaurant book me a flight to to rome next week find me the best flight deal 
by the way, to Rome before you book it type of thing. Like, where are we today versus where we would need to be to be able to actually have that level of interaction with it, where it's more integrated, I guess, into our daily lives? So it's there. All of those capabilities are possible today, every single one that you mentioned. Okay. So you could, if you want, you're going on a trip, you could tell the AI system, I'm going on a trip with six people. Our budget is specifically $2,150. These are the types of things that we want to do, plan an itinerary. AI can do that. It can go as far as making the reservations. You can sync your calendars and your email with AI systems. So maybe you use maybe you use Microsoft system for you know PowerPoint and all of that. Mm-hmm. You could use Microsoft's uh, Copilot, which is their version of like a ChatGPT, and you could ask it for things. Summarize the this crazy long email thread that I don't have time to read. Summarize it for me. Take out the first three action items and start drafting the response. Uh, or you do have agents that can go in and make dinner reservations on your behalf. So all of that already exists. We're not at the point where we use it at scale, where it becomes kind of like a verb, like Google it, Uber it. We're not right. at the point where it's kind of mass adoption, but the capabilities are already there. All of that is possible. You could even, I mean, today you can take a photo of what's in your fridge and ask it to reply with recipes. Like, this is what I have left. I don't have time to go to the grocery store. There's a snowstorm. What can I make? And it will suggest a recipe. Or you can take a photo of food that you have, cooked food, and ask, what is the recipe for this? How do you think this person made this? And it would respond with the recipe. So it's already able to do a lot of stuff. Uh, And it's just going to get more so as time goes on. So all of that sounds really fascinating to me. It's really exciting stuff. On the flip side of that, I wonder when you take away... When you create something that creates ease, simplicity, right? Where you don't have to open the fridge by yourself and figure it out. You're not using your brain anymore to actually think of what, you know, problem solve, essentially, at its most basic level. When you integrate or introduce an AI that's going to do all of that for you, I worry that we're going to start to lose our, I don't know what the right word is here, but our ability to just problem solve. It's kind of like now... You remember when you used to take a taxi and the driver just used to know all of the routes, right? They didn't have uh, maps or or, or Google or whatever. But now I can't drive anywhere in the city without turning on my Google Maps because I just don't know the the streets, right? Like the ability to problem solve seems to be disappearing. I just want, let's just start maybe with your thoughts there. Yeah, so I don't think problem solving is disappearing. I think we're solving different problems because of technology. So do you really gain anything memorizing the topography of your city versus being able to quickly see where you need to go in maps? And then maybe you have more time for creative tasks or more strategic tasks because AI is telling the Uber driver where to go versus the person kind of pulling over and taking out a map. Mm. Uh, The same is with a fridge. I mean, arguably, if you were to rewind the clock just 200 years ago, pre-electricity, and people saw, you just put everything in this fridge. You don't actually go and (laughs) get it from the land and solve problems of how to grow. Like most of us, if we were put on a farm, it would be over. We're toast. (laughs) We are are absolutely toast. And that would seem just absolutely existential to people that you couldn't survive for a week on on an actual farm with vegetation and things around you. Nope, sorry, couldn't. I'm getting nervous thinking about it. (laughs) But the problems that we're solving, and arguably, of course, people would have different perspectives on uh, if these are problems that we should be solving or not, but being able to fly, we're in space, we're combating illnesses. Uh, I mean, even just the discovery of antibiotics, that, I mean, we take it for granted now, was a scientific absolute revolution. It was a game changer. So what technology and science and innovation has historically done and continues to do is free up time to solve bigger and more challenging problems and pass the things that we don't necessarily need to solve for our existence to other systems. And I think that that's a pretty good trade-off. I mean, I can only imagine what we're going to get to solve when we pass a lot of the things that we do on the day-to-day to AI. So it's not that knowledge and problem solving goes away. We just exert and test for knowledge in new ways and solve fundamentally different problems. And I think that that's going to be really cool. Are you excited for the future? I am. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Like being in the weeds here, seeing the potential pitfalls, 
I imagine it could get easy to, to get cynical about what could happen. I mean, you're dealing with humans, ultimately, right? So are you excited for what's coming, or are you more cautious and reserved because of what you're seeing? Yeah, I actually think I'm a lot more excited. Being able to track the signals into the future and see what could be possible, I find it so inspiring. Because we, I also see that every problem we think we have as a society, as a species, we have the solutions for. They exist. And if they don't, we know how to make them happen. We know how to turn them into a reality. And to me, that's very inspiring uh, and very optimistic. And it makes fighting for the optimistic scenarios worth it. Will we make the human decisions to do the right thing? That's a different question. But what looking into the future shows me is that all of the answers are there. And to me, that's really, really exciting. Mm. How, how, go ahead. If I asked different AI models the same question, would I get the same answer across the board? No. And if you ask the same AI system You're a different the same question, it could give you, if, if it depends on how the AI system was trained. But if you're using a generative AI system, a ChatGBT, a Google's Bard, and you asked it a question, that required that wasn't just one plus one. Even then, sometimes you might mm -hmm. get different. You make it three, you make it three hundred. But for most of the generative AI systems, yes, you can ask them the same question, and it would give you a different result. You ask a different AI system, it's definitely going to give you a different result. How do you know which one to use? I guess just yeah. one that you like, I guess, or. And that's a new skill that humans are going to have to develop. When we've been, and, and we had to do it with search, right? When we. Google something, there's all of these different papers and things that come up, and we have to figure out a way, how do we piece this together? I mean, mm -hmm. before it was like there was maybe one book in the school library, and that's the answer. And then we have the entire web. Uh, and so now it's discerning what type of information is most useful for me uh, in an era where AI kind of generates and passes it to you. And that's, again, another skill that we're going to have to build and freshen up. Uh, and that's why even for, for schools, for example, I know that there's a lot of debate about not writing essays or getting AI to write the essay. But if AI can write a basic essay, let's let it do that. Let's level the playing field and or up the playing field on what humans have to bring to the table. So AI can go write that B minus essay. You have to discern how do you make this better? How do you argue against this essay that ChatGBT wrote? Those are fundamentally more challenging skills uh, that we just need to start to develop or start to know that we need to test or learn or lean into. Would you consider so would you consider ChatBT as an answer as plagiarism? Because I know that's being debated, right? If we don't change how we test for knowledge, then sure. If you're if the deliverable is go home and write an essay and a student and don't use AI and a student uses AI, well then that could be considered cheating. But I just think we shouldn't be doing that. I think we should. the assumption should be somebody's going to use AI, and we make the test harder as a result. So sure, you go co-create with AI, and now you come back into school, and you have to upgrade that essay, which is a lot harder. Mm. I mean, I couldn't imagine if somebody gave me an A- minus essay and told me to make it better. Where do you even begin? Or write one at home with ChatGPT, and you write something different in school. So I think we just need to change how we test for knowledge. But if we don't, then sure, we're going to have what seems like a lot of cheating, but it's just more so I think the system is outdated. I think that's interesting because, one, I don't think they will change how they test it, but to say something like make this B minus and A plus is a lot, is very difficult because you would look at it as a B minus student and be, this is perfect. I can't, this make is this phenomenal. Any, I can't make this any better. So that's a different way to look at it, which I think is very interesting. Kind of like the calculator, right? We all got stuck with calculus and algebra because of the invention of the calculator. That was like a small segment of really smart mathematicians. Oh, the calculator made basic arithmetic something that we all had in our fingertips. Everybody now has to learn calculus because it's because oh, now you have this tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we all kind of got screwed, but yeah. technically in a kind of good way, we that started sense. to solve harder problems. And that's the story of technology over time. You give some to technology and it frees us frees up our neurons to go solve different and more challenging problems. Well, I see it's funny you say that because one of the things I am excited about is the fact that I am not uh, I'm not a I can't draw, right? But I'm, I have an imagination. So with an AI component, I can go in and say, you know, draw up this. Mm -hmm. And it'll do it for me. It's like, no, 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 change that one little thing. 
And then suddenly I'm able to create an art, a piece of art that I otherwise would not have been able to. And so I feel like there's going to be plenty of things similar to that that are going to be unlocked for a lot of people who had limitations. I mean, how many people are amazing at using Photoshop to create something, but if you put a you know, a, a pencil in their hand, they couldn't draw a hand if their life depended on it, mm-hmm. right? Like that unlocks all of that for, for a whole segment of people. A professor of mine, uh, Avi Goldfarb, he's actually at the UFT, and he has a great quote for this. A lot of people are really creative, but not everybody can draw. And so mm. what AI does for some people, it removes that kind of challenge or that limitation and unlocks your actual creative ability. So maybe it isn't sketching or Photoshop, but you have a really creative mind. AI becomes this tool uh, that you can exercise that creative aspiration. Or another quote that I love is um, from a professor, again, in, in, in Toronto, Alexander Manu, that AI is just going to become another poor that we express ourselves through. And so it does become this unlock for people that want to be creative. They have the ideas. It's just maybe they're not great at writing, but they're great about Im- they're great at imagining. Or they're not great at drawing, but they have a great vision board in their mind. Mm. And that's going to be really cool. A way I like to describe where we are in this moment. The camera's been invented, but movies haven't. And that's what I think. Mm. That's where I think we are in this moment with AI. Mm. The technology is here. We have yet to invent the industries and the art forms that it's going to lead to. And I think that's really cool. So what would you say to the people that are worried about their jobs because of AI? The Mm -hmm. photographers, the videographers, the creatives out there who have expressed concerns about AI taking over the roles, the writers, the actors. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Yeah, I think there's kind of two things to discuss. The first is whose data are these systems being trained on? And we need to see data in many ways as a form of labor. Somebody has created and done that and and brought it to life. And right now we have a situation where many creatives, especially, aren't getting compensated uh, or didn't even consent to their work training and building these AI systems. So I think that is something that we need to solve. Intellectual property, digital likeness, ownership, um, regardless of what happens with AI. So that's a very valid thing that we need to, to figure out. When it comes to what creatives are going to do or what jobs are going to be automated. So of course, I think that there will be some jobs that will be taken by artificial intelligence. But it's also, I mean, AI takes what you do well and enhances it like tenfold. So the smartphone, I mean, now that we have smartphones, nobody asked me to shoot the cover of Vogue. I wasn't suddenly like ridden up to be the best photographer. So just because we have a tool, it's still the human brain that's that actually is where the creativity lies. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, another quote that I love from Alexander Mano is, you know, a, a knife can't be a, sh- a threat to a chef. So creatives, they have masterful minds um, that the average person just doesn't necessarily have. uh, And that doesn't go away. Will there be, though, modifications in some form of augmenting with these professions? Yeah. Uh, And that is something that I think is is really worrisome. I mean, I've spent many years working as a fashion model, and I've been very open about that being a job that AI might threaten. uh, And that doesn't make me feel great at all. Uh, I do think over time, new jobs get invented that we can't imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. social media manager didn't exist. The crater economy, this didn't exist just over a decade ago. And this entire industry has been created because of technology. So it's going to, it's much easier to imagine the jobs a technology is going to automate than it is the jobs that it's going to create. But I am concerned the way we are just kind of deploying AI into these creative sectors um, and not making sure, you know, whose data are these systems being trained on, uh, who's getting entirely locked out. And I hope that we get this right. I hope intellectual property doesn't just collapse on itself. And I hope there aren't movie studios training AI systems on the hard work of actors and writers and, you know, the makeup artists, all of the true creatives that make Hollywood and these industries what it is. I hope we get that right and we don't exploit that um, because that, I think, is not is is a future that we don't want to walk towards um, and won't work out well for people. So, and we have a choice not to do that. Um, and we do see unions speaking up. 
Um, but I hope we make the right the right decision there because art is something that's really important. Art always evolves and the conversation of art has to evolve. I mean, the reason why songs are three minutes is because that was the limitations on record players and things. Right. So it's always evolved with technology, um, but we have to make sure we're not necessarily exploiting people as the cost of that evo evo uh, evolution because I don't think that that's going to work out well. Maybe. Isn't that what like humans do? Kind of exploit? I mean, that's a very... I mean, I, I don't. I, yeah, we don't have the we don't have the best track record as a species. <laughs> We've made some very yeah. questionable like it's, it's decisions. Nice, it's, 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 nice, it's nice to decisions, want, yeah. but like, ex the exploit, like it's. Yeah. yeah, but we also have made rules to try to protect against some of that. I mean, we invented something called copyright. Before mm -hmm. that, it was just the absolute wild west. Like, oh, you wrote that? No, actually, now I did. But now we have these kind of types of frameworks and and different ways to think through things and standards and protocols. So we do make some great decisions. We just have to make those. Yeah. And can we count on us? I don't know. Well, I hope let's, so. Let's be optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for us. I'm yeah. rooting for us. I, think we can. I like to root, for, I like to root yeah. for us, so I'm going to root for us. I think we can. I think, on, I think that's a... Let's, yeah. let's go with optimism. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> I think we can. I mean, I'm, I'm excited for what the future holds. I mean, I think most of what's going to be unlocked, we can't even imagine the way we couldn't imagine the creator economy 10, 20 years ago. It just yeah. didn't exist. And most of us have a foot in it in some way. Imagine what just happens. Just like we do here. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. literally, yeah. yeah. When AI is like your co-creator or on your team. <laughs> that should be interesting. It's going to yeah. be very interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming through. Thanks Appreciate for having you. me. This, was, so this was insightful. Thanks for having and, me. And a pleasure. And uh, keep fighting the good fight <laughs> 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 for our species. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, try. And uh, yeah, let's do this again. Yeah, sounds uh, good. As things evolve in this space, we'd love to continue to have this conversation and hopefully help educate people on what's possible and what's available out there. Yeah, well, I'll be back. I'm totally down for that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.